Need, need I say more, or did that uh, give you the message? It is great to be with you on this wonderful holy day. So, I'm not sure what to make of Mitch Showers. I don't know if that bears a response or not. I could say some things, but I'm not. I mean, we have to do a little bit more work. I mean, there are also those people that were making, shall we say, um, unkind comments about what this light is all about, you know. <laughs> are you going to start wearing it? <laughs> you know, you'd look good with a halo. Actually, well, there, there are uh, several reasons for the light, but one of them is so that you know, we have the lights turned on. One of the, the latest um, webcasts, I noticed that I'm turning into a reflector. The you know, lights um, tend to um, reflect off the lack of hair. <laughs> We're all getting older. I guess I'm, I'm hoeing in them short rows as well. It is very good to be here. The title of the sermon is up on the screen. But actually, this is taken from, if you'll turn with me over to Revelation chapter 15. This is taken, uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And this is a pivotal scripture that I've come to call the proclamation of proclamations. And actually, what we will do today is simply fill in some of the gaps of this pivotal scripture. Then the seven angels sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And then we notice something, it takes us to the scene in heaven, and we notice what happens there. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, and who, is, who was, and who is to come, because you've taken your great power and reigned. I mean, this is the proclamation when Jesus Christ intervenes in world affairs. And indeed, it is necessary. I mean, if we um, look at the daily news and, and the situation, I mean, we have, the, we have the, the biggest chasm of contrasts that we probably have ever had. On the one hand, we are absolutely morally bankrupt. And then on the other, things have never been as good. And of course, atheists would ar argue that the lack of religion is perhaps c contributing to that, but that's not the case. We, as we heard in the sermon this morning, I mean, wasn't that a great story? I mean, the, uh, I, mean I just can't imagine uh, what that must have been like. And the, I mean, I'm, I was born three years after that event. <laughs> So I, I guess in, in that sense, I'm still very young. But there will be a time, as we heard this morning, that they will not be called back. And bombs of every sort and kind will literally destroy the earth. And that is why this proclamation is so critical. The revelation of Jesus Christ, and that's what the book of Revelation actually is. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it says in the very first pages of that particular book. The revelation of Jesus Christ declares that when the seventh angel sounds, there will be...
literally pivots and the power and promise of what I've called the seven ands contained in this one, one proclamation. If you look at your Bible, if it's, I have a New King James Bible, there are various different versions. If you count down through, there are seven times when there's a capital and. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at each one of these ands and how it provides a, a framework, if you will, on the events that unfold as the Feast of Trumpets goes into fulfillment. We've already read this. The trumpet shall sound and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. I don't even know how to describe that. I mean, the, the power of what is being stated here cannot be overstated. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. There is a transfer of ownership. And it goes all the way back. Here I am showing the um, familiar um, statue from Daniel chapter 2. It's taken from one of our booklets. And all of these kingdoms culminate, we'll go to Daniel chapter 2 in a minute, will culminate, culminate and be taken over by the event that we are celebrating today. You know, you start out with the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greco-Macedonians, and then, of course, the Roman Empire that came all the way down through time, and we'll see another resurrection uh, prior to the return of Jesus Christ. And, you know, we see elements in our secular, in secularism today, and particularly in, in, in what is called the left wing of politics, that purport on the one hand to be the high priests of tolerance. That is, until you disagree with them. The Roman Empire was like that. I mean, that is why we see here in, in the statue, uh, it was made of iron. And then you come down to our time and you have the ten kings that will be established prior to Jesus Christ's return. And it has a, an uncanny mixture of iron and clay. That's not, I don't know if that's even, chemi I mean, probably somebody here was a background in chemistry and whether that's even possible to mix those two uh, materials together. But in any case, it's going to be very fragile. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, in verse 44 through 45, I think, sums it up pretty well. What we read in the first and. <clears throat> and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. You saw the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. So what is announced in this proclamation is exactly what uh, Daniel adds a lot more color to. You have all these different kingdoms down through time that get ground up into powder and are literally replaced with an everlasting kingdom that shall never be destroyed. So just to, um, again, provide a little bit of context, I think, um, at least for me, it's easy to come to the Feast of Trumpets, and um, we have a great meal, and so we should. I mean, it's, everything is nice. We don't even think about the, the we, we don't have any fear coming here. Uh, we, 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 just, we just have it really nice. We have, we have something in the future that is very different. Notice here, uh, th this is just, this is a few chapters prior to Revelation chapter 11. And the kings of earth, this is in Revelation chapter 6 verse 14, it's up there. Um, and the kings of the earth 
the great men and rich men and commanders and the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in caves and in rocks of the mountains. Now think about it. What would it take in order for the great men of our day to get to the point where they would hide themselves? I mean, we see here the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up. I mean, we're, we, we talk about climate change. I mean, this, this is climate change of a different sort than what is being um, espoused right now. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. I mean, these, this is the reaction great men will have during what is called the day of the Lord, the one year prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Let's take another look here. Here we have the a close up of the graphic. I thought it was kind of nicely done, um, showing a, um, looks like a jewel, grinding it all up. So you have supernatural intervention, but huge physical consequences. I think if you do the math of all the things that occur and all the um, plagues and the trumpets, it, you come up with about 10% of the population will be left. And if you just, I mean, you don't even, I, I don't even want to begin to think, maybe we should, on occasion think about that, but you know, if, if you had even a fraction, I mean, if you have, you look, look at how when we have a hurricane, uh, how that overwhelms um, services and infrastructure, you know, when you start uh, talking about the kinds of things we heard in a sermon this morning, it, um, is, it's something entirely different. <clears throat> The other thing that will happen um, right after, you know, in order for the kingdoms to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ is, well, the God of this world has to be put away. And that's found in Revelation chapter 20, in verse four, uh, verses 1 through 4. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into a bottomless pit, and shut him up, set a seal on him, so that he should not deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were finished, but after this he must be released for a little while. The irony that, that I've always wondered is, I mean, human beings apparently just can't help themselves, because upon release, human beings, even after a thousand years, um, of experiencing the kingdom of God go back to their old ways. <clears throat> so what about the, the second end? And this is, has already been um, alluded to, but I think it is worth mentioning because the emphasis is that he shall reign forever and ever. We think of, I think rightly so, oftentimes the 1,000-year uh, reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, and that is true. That is, uh, in some ways, theologically, theologically uh, innovative. Um, it, many people, I mean, know when, when I came into the church many years ago, that was new. And you ask yourself, how could that be new? I mean, it's right in the Bible, but... It is, it is something that has over, uh, often been overlooked. Uh, not so much today. I think most evangelicals um, believe in some form of an earthly reign of Jesus Christ at this point. But that's just the beginning. The second and after that is intimated after this trumpet sounds is that this is not a thousand year reign. This is to go on forever and ever. Notice this was also prophesied back in Daniel chapter 7. And I was watching in a night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming from the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And if you look at the, the language here, 
I mean, not only, I mean, it, it's, it adds depth to what we're talking about because here you have a Old Testament reference to God the Father, and the and Jesus Christ often referred to himself as the Son of Man. So here you have that uh, connection as it relates to, as we will see in a minute, the forever part. <clears throat> then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. I mean, that, that is consistent with, with the, the first hand, that all the kingdoms will become his. It is not a local kingdom, just like Noah's flood was not a local flood. I mean, it, it is a comprehensive solution to the, the problem that man has created for 6,000 years. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Daniel prophesied this in Daniel chapter 7. You come forward into the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 1, there is a lengthy discourse with respect to the nature of Jesus Christ and the fact that he um, was the Son of God and so on and so forth. Excuse me. And I'm breaking into <clears throat> the greater context simply because I wanted to highlight that this idea of a kingdom that goes way beyond a thousand years is throughout the entire Bible. <clears throat> but to the son, he says, your throne, O God, it's interesting that he is referred to here as God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And then we um, <clears throat> have the um, statement here regarding the um, involvement of the, um, the saints. And I've always been bothered by this particular scripture. I mean, I like the back part of it. It's the front part I don't like so much. And I saw the thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. I mean, this is... Um, a participatory kingdom. You know, think, think about it. Jesus Christ and God the Father could have very well ruled the whole thing by fiat, by themselves, you know, kind of like Rome, all roads uh, lead to Rome, everything um, is ruled by Christ, and indeed that's the case. But um, he is giving his saints the opportunity to rule with him. I, I'd just like to go back to the first part of it, though. I mean, for years and centuries, people speculated about the sign of the beast and what that would be and how, how it would be possible. Um, and we are at a point right now where technologically um, that's not only possible, it is um, preferable. Because when you start thinking about what would happen if you were to do some type of implant or uh, mark, there are many different ways you could do it, um, that, that will, I think, gain widespread acceptance very quickly, just like cell phones did, uh, because of the, the convenience factor of just being able to um, scan in and we're conditioned for it. You know, how many people, you know, start, start talking about the sign of the bees to your neighbors, and they're going to say, you know, you, you got him locked up in the basement? You know, you, you, where is your beast that you're talking about? I mean, it's, it, and I, I bring that up because I think it is important that, that we keep that in the forefront of our minds as technology progresses. And, you know, what, what is the exact form going to be? I mean, it's going to be more than technology, obviously, because it involves worshiping a system. Um, so, I mean, I'm not... I'm not here to reveal what it's going to be, only calling our attention to the fact that um, it is, again, something that is between us. 
between now and the proclamation that we're celebrating today. <clears throat> I wanted to take a look at this scripture um, in, in this particular context, um, referencing back to the scripture we looked at earlier, where you have people uh, asking rocks to fall on them and hiding in caves. And this, this um, I think, brings some insight into the approach that Jesus Christ uh, takes in the, the kingdom that will go on forever and ever. Notice, this is a prophecy that we often read during the millennium, as, as we should, but uh, what, what I'm doing today is just uh, pointing out the fact that Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, captures all of these things. And one of the reasons that I, I think, I mean, this, this is a, a more natural explanation, but one of the reasons that the kingdom of God is sustainable is not just the fact that Jesus Christ is the king. I'm not trying to minimize that. But also the fact that the approach that he takes makes it sustainable. He says here uh, in, in Jeremiah chapter 16, notice, um, therefore the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought the children out of Israel from the land of Egypt. That in itself is, ex is an extraordinary statement. Because if you talk to anybody with a, a Jewish background, um, or you know, anybody in the Church of God for that matter, the exodus out of Egypt is central to so many things. I mean, even, even in secular circles, because... Um, the Exodus is seen as, you know, the kind of the classic story about liberty, where you have slave people that are rescued by God from a tyrannical leader, and, you know, they go off to the promised land. I mean, there are just so many different metaphors that are pulled out of this. And here, here we have a prophecy about a time in the future, about a time in the future in which we, we no longer reference that. We will rather say the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. And the irony is that most people have no idea that they were driven there. They've lost their identity precisely because they did not celebrate the days we now celebrate. So Israel in general has lost their identity so much so, in fact, that if you bring it up, they, they scoff at the idea. For I will bring them back into their land, which I gave to their fathers. And here's the methodology. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord. When Jesus Christ called his disciples and said, Come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. It was not a new idea. He was, it's reminiscent of what is being prophesied here. Now think about it. You've got all these people that have been disaffected and scared and ha are hiding in caves and all around the world, and you have a all-powerful, supernatural spirit ruler who takes the time to commission and to call individuals to go after every single one of them. Notice, behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them, and afterward I will send many hunters. I don't know if you have to have a license or not, but you know, I know they're, they're probably... How, how many of you in here consider yourselves fishermen? Okay. How many hunters? Yeah, but see, the prophecy is fulfilled. You, you can be both, you know? <laughs> You know, hunters and fishermen. I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of every hole in the rock. The reason I want, to, I want us to think about this for a moment is, what government do you know? What ruler do you know that has done this?
where you actually go after the lost sheep. This is, uh, like I said, this is, a, this is a differentiator of the kingdom of God that also makes it sustainable so that the prophecy that it will go on forever and ever and ever, clearly, I mean, God can do anything. All I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is that in order for that to work, it also has to work on an individual level. And he's so concerned that he sends out individuals to go after individuals. And then we have the third and. I mean, here, notice what the, what the 24 elders say. We give you thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is and was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and intervened is maybe another way of putting it. Here you have, you know, you, you, you start out with a proclamation that's about Christ's return. And we... We, we have the, the first hand talked about the fact that the kingdoms, that his kingdom would consume up all other kingdoms. And then the second hand, it was emphasized that it would go on forever and ever and ever. And now we come to the third hand, and it emphasizes the, the fact of who the king is. <clears throat> there are many different places I could go to, to look at that, um, but... And I, I think this takes it all the way back to the beginning. This is the earlier beginning. In the beginning was the Word. Notice that this connects back to He was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So you have the, the light giver, the life giver, the God of the universe, the one that created everything, coming back to this earth in a very different way than he did the first time. Although that was uh, remarkable in its own way, because, I mean, that, it, it seems that Satan has the ability to get mankind into a position where they never get what they anticipate. So at the time that Jesus Christ came the first time, his people were looking for an almighty king to come and establish a kingdom. And instead, he, became, he came as a child and, and sacrificed himself. Now, the world is looking, the world that is still looking for him, to a large extent, is looking for something entirely different. You know, you have a rapture and you all go up to heaven and, you know, the various different ideas. And he will come as a mighty king. <clears throat> Notice in Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He was, and he is, and as we see here, is to come, as we see here, in glory to sit on his throne. And this leads right into the next end. The next end was the end, the time of the dead that they should be judged. Continuing on in uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 through 36. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. All of this is captured in the little framework of the proclamation 
of Revelation 11, verse 15. Inherit the kingdom from the foundation of the world for. And then here he gives the rationale. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. You know, this is the time of the dead that they should be judged in particular people who knew Christ because of the, the context that is being used here in Matthew chapter 25. And I find it remarkable what it is that is cited. Obviously, there are more things. But the, the one thing that all of these things have in common is that it is something that everybody can do at some level. Particularly here in the United States, I mean, who does not have enough to be able to feed someone who's hungry? The bigger problem might be finding somebody that's hungry. Of course, you can always, you know, you go find a teenager, and uh, they're always hungry. But I, but I think, I don't think that's, that's what is meant. The, you, you have all the complexities, and the greatness, and the the glorious entry, if you will, of what is being described in Revelation chapter 21, chapter 11. And yet when it comes down to the end of the day, it comes down to some really, really basic things. Food, water, clothing, shelter. I mean, it's the, the basic necessities of life that uh, Christ says, made the difference. The righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see, see or thirsty and give you drink? When did you see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you and the king will answer and say to them, assuredly I say to you inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren you did it to me. This is both a frightening and encouraging statement when you think about it. On the frightening side <laughs> is, 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 the, is the fact that you have individuals who call him Lord, who apparently um, didn't even think about uh, the fact that they were doing these things. So I say it's frightening because you know, if you don't even think about it, you could just as easily miss the whole point, right? But the encouraging side of it is that if we follow Jesus Christ, and as I mentioned in my sermon last week, the fact that we are commanded to keep the holy days and celebrate with food and drink and all of those things, um, it's pretty hard to keep all the feasts and not do most of what is... Um, listed in here. But it comes back down, it comes back down to uh, some really basic things. <clears throat> then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angel. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they make an entirely different claim. This is even more frightening. They claimed that <clears throat> they um, had done all of these things to them, but notice the, the language, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? These are individuals who will, be, who will fall short at the day of accounting because they thought they were doing all these things. Uh, they called him Lord and called him Lord, and as Jesus Christ himself said, um, <clears throat> there will be many who will call me Lord, Lord, 
but do not do the things that I say. And at the, the end of the day, he says, he will tell them, depart from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. <clears throat> and then the final result of the, the judgment, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And then you have the fifth and. And that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints. And, you know, no sermon about the Feast of Trumpets would be complete without going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul writes to them and says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And I underline this because we're going to come back to this. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is pivotal. And that is also um, what causes many to, to not believe, and we'll come back to that. But notice, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then he comes and says, and therefore comfort one another with these words. So, you know, I, you know are you prepared for liftoff? You know, it's, it's one of those things that um, we have to look forward to to go meet the Lord in the air. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, we... We, what is the practical application of this, or how can we prepare for this particular event? You, know, you, you, you look at the other things, and you know, we talk about um, preparing to be kings and priests. Uh, that's something that maybe we haven't talked about as much recently. Uh, but I, I remember distinctly when, we, when I came into the church, um, <clears throat> the pastor was on this. You know how pastors are sometimes, you know. Um, that was supposed to be funny. I was referring to myself. You know, they, they get off on this kick, you know, and they, they just kind of talk about the same thing all the time. And Mr. Foster was on this teaching kick. You know, we prepare to teach, prepare to teach, prepare to teach. And I didn't like it so much because I, that wasn't something that I was in, uh, that inclined to do, at least not at that point of since... Um, I mean, it, it somehow it finally it finally sunk in that, that teaching is is a good thing. So we prepare to teach. We prepare to become kings and priests. And you know, even even if you look at the 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 commandment, I mean, there's a very practical uh, application of the last day of accounting because we feed people. So I was thinking about preparing to meet the Lord in the air. And I've I've I have pr uh, propositioned a couple of things. One of them is skydiving. I, I highly recommend it. It's, I mean, it, it, it's a great conditioning tool. You know, you're supposed to confront your fears. But then, you know, it, it, I don't know how practical that would be for a congregation. So I've got a better proposal. And uh, I haven't talked to Amanda yet. I mean, I'm talking about Amanda Miller. I also haven't talked to Mr. Stiver about this. But I'm sure he'll approve it. Um, so th this is kind of the the outing that uh, Amanda can plan um, for next summer to prepare to meet the Lord in the air. Now, for those of you that don't recognize this picture, this is from the front seat of the dragster at Cedar Point. See, I mean, it's not that far. I mean, it's only an hour or so to go to Cedar Point. Now, let, let me just, I mean, you, you will be amazed at how cohesive this thing is with scripture once you've seen this whole thing. Um, <clears throat> but, but let me give you a couple of facts. So as you're sitting here, 
contemplating meeting the Lord in the air, what you're actually sitting on is a cart that is propelled by the same kind of technology that is used on, air, uh, on aircraft carriers to uh, launch airplanes. So, you know, you would, you would expect, they actually, the, the cables get so hot that they have to put water on them to keep them cool. So it launches you at 120 miles an hour, and then you go straight up. I mean, it's literally, you, you, you I'm not going to say you're going to meet the Lord, but you're going to meet something up there at the top. <laughs> 350 feet in the air, and then you come straight back down, kind of like to, you know, you land your feet on the Mount of Olives type of thing. But you can see the scripture here, behold, I mean, this is, this, this is the practice. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. No kidding. <laughs> I mean, you're sitting there and the thing is revving up, nobody's sleeping. But we shall all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. <clears throat> now that translation isn't quite clear. Here is a better version. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all need changed. <laughs> so now that we've got that out of the way, I'm going to roll the tape. So we're back. Um, I want to give you the replay here, uh, just so that you see uh, why I think this is a wonderful way to practice meeting the Lord in the air. So these are some stills as you, you go up there. Notice, look at that. Then we who are alive, I mean, that's the question, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. I mean, look at that. I mean, the, the, the graphic, you see light up here in the right-hand corner, and then, of course, you get to always be with the Lord. And the question, the, the big theological question is always, you know, we will be with the Lord always, but where? I mean, really, you want to stay on top? I mean, look at that view. Actually, the scriptures fit in really well. I mean, when we meet the Lord in the air, we, it will give us a new perspective. Remember this? Zechariah chapter 18 says this, And in that day it shall be that the living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. The amazing thing, I mean, you can actually live this because if you look out front, you're looking at the western sea. But if you turn around and look back, you'll be able to see the Eastern Sea because it's Lake Erie. Okay, this is the bay. You know, it's amazing how this works. But then, but then you know, there's the trip down. So let's take a look at how that looks. It's great perspective. Thus the Lord my God will come. Emphasis on the word thus. I mean, it's going down in a twisted loop, and all the saints will be with him. So, um, again, it's great practice. I'm, I, I, can see, I can see from the expression out there, everybody's already just ready to sign up. You know, we're probably going to have to make several trips so that everybody can go. And you shall... And it, this fits really well. You flee. You flee through my mountain valley. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. Now, I did this, and in no, mean, in no way mean to make light of these scriptures. I make it I say it to make a point. This thing's scary, except for people like me. I, I just, I love it. 
but I have a poorly de developed sense of fear. But let's think about it seriously for a moment, and, 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 and I think especially in our culture and in my generation, we haven't seen anything. I remember the Vietnam War. I remember reading about it. But it was a faraway thing. You know, we've had these wars in faraway places. Um, I don't know if my generation knows what courage is. I don't know if we know what fear is. We think stuff like this is fear. Getting shot up a 350-foot tower strapped in a five-point safety harness. I don't know that they've ever had any accidents in that particular ride. Doesn't take any courage. <laughs> the time that is just ahead of us will. The time that is just ahead of us will take absolute sheer grit. So we come back to this particular statement, and I just I, I want to spend a few minutes on this um, <laughs> resurrection thing. In, in to the Thessalonians. Paul wrote, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So the emphasis here is if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And, and I'm talking about actually believing it. This is one of those other things where uh, the, the notion of, or the myth is maybe the way to put it. It's almost become mythology, this idea of a, a suffering Christ that died on Friday, rose on Sunday morning, and, you know, uh, it's metaphorical. I mean, it's, it's, it's all of a lot of things. I mean, it's been so um, mythologized that I think it's lost its meaning. <clears throat> so that's why I think it is good for us today to just for a moment for a few minutes, um, contemplate what Paul is actually saying here, and we'll let him help us do that um, in his letter to the Corinthians. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. We, we, we often read what I had uh, referred to earlier, that the fact that in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and the last trump and all that um, stuff, we focus on that, but actually... The first uh, 15 or so verses of um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is almost much more important because here's where Paul builds the argument for the actual, factual resurrection of Jesus Christ in a manner that almost sounds like he's making his case in a court of law. And, of course, uh, Paul was both capable of doing that and often had the opportunity to argue um, for this. And he says, he, he makes this argument and, and highlights the criticality of an actual resurrection. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And it didn't go somewhere. They, they perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. So you have this, you know, he lays it out on the line to basically state either Jesus Christ arose or he didn't. And if he did not, then this, all, this is all a big sham. So somehow, I think what has happened is we have mythologized the whole concept of, of um, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to the point where 
you know, it just doesn't, um, it doesn't feel real. And it started very cleverly, didn't it? You know, Jesus said, you know, you think about this, Jesus said that he would be in the <clears throat> midst of the earth for three days and three nights like Noah was in the belly of a whale. Three days and three nights. What, did, what came along right away? You, you change that. I mean, you, 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 you go to the parts of three days arguments, and that it doesn't, the math doesn't work very well on that either. And, you know, now um, we, we live in a culture, I was, I, I was listening to a debate uh, on a podcast this week where a um, very prominent atheist from Oxford University, I mean, he, he was literally poking fun at the person with whom he was debating the, the whole notion that he said, you don't really believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again. I mean, come on. I mean, everybody knows that's not true. So, um, the ac actually, um, just to, to uh, finish out that thought for a moment, um, that line of reasoning is no longer the case. I mean, he was, um, he was doing what is often done when, when, you, when you can't win the argument on facts. What has been done in time immemorial, you start making fun of the other person. Um, so that's what, what, what he was doing, which actually reveals the fact that um, he was, I think, a bit unsure of what he was talking about. But um, the, the um, historians today, there are very few that um, do not affirm the fact that Jesus Christ actually lived, that he was crucified, that he was buried and that there was an empty tomb. So uh, that, that actually is a lot of progress. Um, and these, these are, in some cases, atheist uh, historians that have come to that conclusion. The, the reason for the empty tomb is still the same problem. Uh, you know, they, they argue around that much in a similar way of what they did in the first century. But here's... <clears throat> Here's the uh, verse 3 to 8 that I think is very important um, in, and Paul uses this to make his case. For I delivered to you first of all that I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. Now, start thinking about this from just simply... The, the case for a resurrection. All of these people that saw him, including the 12, and then here's the, um, here is the, this is, uh, this is a long time after Christ's death. I don't remember exactly when Corinthians was, was written, sometime in the 60s, I think. <clears throat> but notice the next statement. After that, Jesus he, Jesus, was seen by over 500 brethren at once. So this is something that the, the other apostles don't record that Paul uh, records. The fact that there was an encounter where there were 500 brethren at the same time where Jesus Christ appeared to them. And then um, what is, is even more impressive here is of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep. After this, he was seen by James and then all the apostles and last of all by me. So what does this have to do with rewarding your servants, the prophets? Everything. Because as Paul said earlier, if, the, if Jesus Christ did not rise... We're still in our sins. And if Jesus Christ did not rise, there will be no reward. So that is a critical uh, component that I think will provide also. I mean, it, we, this is something I think we need to be very well grounded in. Not just, I mean, I, I, I think most of us, and rightly so, I mean, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it kind of thing. Um, that's kind of the way I grew up. 
uh, but we live in a an increasingly more secular world where that's just not if you want to have a conversation and you are asked for the hope that lies within you um, you 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 have to have a better argument than just that and we will be confronted with it so we get back to you know you know what is it what is it that's going to propel us through the time yet future that we will be able um, to bear um, what is in front of us the <clears throat> the sermonette this morning um, was quite good the there there's a a way to summarize it, uh, because I, I was actually reading this uh, stuff this week. Um, Viktor Frankl uh, was a uh, famous um, later psychologist who uh, went through the um, Nazi <clears throat> death camps and survived. And he, he is quoted as saying that if you know your why, you can bear almost any how. You know, we know why we are here. And if we know why the Feast of Trumpets, and if we know why um, we keep them, it gives you the ability, as it did Paul and Peter and all of the rest, to bear whatever the how is. And that's what gets us from here to the um, uh, rewarding of the saints. So now we get to <clears throat> the sixth and. And those of you who fear your name, small and great. You know, this intimates a time into the future, doesn't it? Because where else do we read about the small and the great? It's in Revelation chapter 20. Verse 11 and 12. <clears throat> Just as the proclamation and the assimilation of all the kingdoms is not just for the millennium, this proclamation of proclamations in Revelation chapter 11 is also not just about the salvation of the 1,000 years. It talks about those who fear your name, both small and great. In Revelation chapter 20, verses, verses 11 and 12, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, whose face the earth and heavens fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. I mean, we have the Feast of Tabernacles coming up and the last great day in which much more will be taught and said about this particular event. And it is the one thing that um, the Church of God community has from a doctrinal standpoint that is a great differentiator because it answers the really big questions of life. I mean, once you get beyond does God exist and what's my purpose and all of that, inevitably you get confronted with the, the, the question of suffering and injustice and ultimately you get to question how is it that a God of justice allows all these things to occur. You know, if, if God is so merciful that he sent his only begotten son so that everybody could, so that nobody would perish, why is it that we have so much pain and suffering in the world? What about all the people that never knew about God? You know, how can, they, how can God condemn all those to hell if they never even knew that he existed? And this becomes a big, for people that think about it, a big problem. Um, <clears throat> and, and also is one of the reasons why people give up on God. The judgment of the small and great on the eighth day answers that question. 
And that is the, the only coherent answer that I have found that allows for a God that is perfect in justice and perfect, perfectly merciful. So that's something that, um, again, I think is, is a, a, a message that is part, of the, is part of the whole gospel message. It's part of the, um, the holy days that we celebrate. And it is also something that um, I think we can articulate in a manner that will um, answer the question for at least some people that are looking at that. And then we have the, the sevens and, and, and that you would destroy those who destroy the earth. I mean, who, who destroys the earth? The people that destroy the earth are those who ultimately do not believe in God. Now that sounds kind of ironic because you have all those people that believe in Mother Earth and proclaim um, to be uh, saving the planet and the climate and all those kinds of things. But that's not going to be the case. And the reason it's not going to be the case is when you are a godless person, it inevitably ends up in behavior and consequences that will destroy the, the earth. So follow that through with me for a minute. The reason that the cataclysmic events will occur at the end of this age is precisely because people have not followed God. And ultimately it leads to conflict that will destroy the earth. And those who destroy the earth who do not repent... God will destroy in Revelation chapter 20. Then the sea gave up the dead who are in it, and the death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. So you have this proclamation of proclamations that we often read on the, the, uh, on the Feast of Trumpets. And seven times it lists things that by implication it will solve. Leading up to and finally this last and seventh one, but there's more. Then there's the eighth. And it goes from an and to a den. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. You see, it goes beyond the millennium to the great day, to the eighth day. And all that that means, and in this particular case, it is described as the temple of God opening up in heaven, revealing the Ark of His Covenant to be seen in the temple. I mean, what does this sound like? It sounds a lot like the scriptures that I'm going to use to conclude the sermon. Revelation chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. <clears throat> the latest issue of the Beyond Today magazine has a cover that asks a question something like this, you know, heaven on earth. You know, people talk about, you know, going to heaven when in actuality, heaven, as we see here, the new heaven, comes to us. <clears throat> and the, <clears throat> the result is, is astonishing. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So you see here the, the condition that is described. Erases and takes away the very thing that many people uh, find difficult to believe in God for because of all the pain and suffering. I mean, that is, that is one of the, the, the big issues with people that uh, find it difficult to believe in God. You know, why the pain and suffering? You notice here, <clears throat> when we get to the fulfillment of the last great day, God will erase all of it. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write. Write it down. Write it. For these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. That is the ultimate consequence. The ultimate goal, the, the ultimate reward, and I can think of no greater, of the proclamation that is made when the trumpet is sounded and the, uh, the heavens are opened and this day goes into fulfillment. So with that, I hope you have a happy Feast of Trumpets 2019.